um, to be to have this award conferred on me by a jury that includes Paul Goldberger, Adele Chatfield Taylor, um, Vito Redem Redem we never can pronounce this, uh, Rybzinski, who couldn't be with us, and Robert Davis just makes me feel very proud and, and humble at the same time. It, w it was such a thrill, where's Michael, Michael Lakitos, to get that telephone call. It was one of those who, me, telephone calls, and uh, I was thrilled, of course. Uh, so, uh, oh, I have known Henry Hope Reed uh, since my earliest days as a New Yorker, beginning in the mid-1960s. His guidebook, uh, to Central Park. Most of us know him as a classicist, but he wrote this little wonderful guidebook to Central Park. Uh, and it was my first introduction to Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox's great masterpiece of landscape design. And little did I know then that the park would later play such a large part in my life. But today, it's not about uh, Central Park that I wish to speak. Rather, I want to think of Central Park as merely one example of what we mean when we use the word place. That word, place, is especially relevant on this occasion when I'm standing before an audience made up of the most committed place makers and place keepers in the world. I hope you will indulge me as I ask a series of rhetorical questions. For place is something elusive and hard to define with precision, and I'm not sure that I can do anything more than open up a line of inquiry. First, when we speak of a sense of place, what does this mean? What is it exactly that we sense? How indeed do we sense a place, its nature, its character, its genius? And how can we make sense of that which we perceive with our senses? Are we able to articulate certain inherent attributes of placeness? From these questions spring others. How does geography, topography, climate, vegetation, natural resources confer collective and personal meaning on place. There is something intangible and atmospheric that one can sense in the earth and the sky. Mountains, plains, oceans, rivers, vegetation, these geographical features are primary determinants of place consciousness. Climate, too, is a principal source of place impression. Its modulations by technological means are minutely local, constituting only small atmospheric modifications within a macro environment that is much grander, less predictable, and more difficult to control. The duration and intensity of summer and winter, the character of vegetation, levels of precipitation, these environmental givens form a vocabulary of seasonality that is a crucial part of our sense of place, which is why the weather is always newsworthy. Both the natural and the built environments contain spaces and structures of special significance. These are power spots within the matrix of place. Certain kinds of architectural works created to mediate between the mundane and the divine spring to mind. Ancient temples erected for honor and sacrifice, synagogues for worship and instruction, mosques serving as sites of purification, prayer, and preaching, Christian churches consecrated as sanctuaries for holy communion and ceremonies such as baptism, marriage, and funeral rites. Equally important in my mind are the defined but unbuilt spaces that also serve as power spots. The town green, the market square, the public park. Such areas center urban space and serve as sites for mass assembly, celebration, 
political protest. These open spaces are prominent nodes on one's mental map of place. We need to examine the role of history in conferring heightened meaning on certain places. Here we must observe how sites of victory, sacrifice, catastrophe, and shame become sacred through the human impulse to turn them into hallowed grounds. Think for a moment in this regard about the psychological and social significance of place with regard to battlefields such as Gettysburg, the World Trade Center after the twin towers were destroyed by Al-Qaeda terrorists in 2001, or the Nazi concentration camps from the Second World War. As a corollary, let's look at the way in which public art, the statue, the mural, the memorial, confers meaning on place. Hallowed ground, however, needs no plaque, monument, or other artifact to inspire reverence or awe. In this regard, I remember my first sight of the footprint of the original temple of Athena on the Acropolis, which was raised by the Persians in 1480 BC. The Parthenon did not rise on the same foundations as the original temple, but is aligned with it a few yards to the south. Whether or not intended as such, the outline in the grass of the foundation stones of fire-scorched marble of the original temple and the site's intentional vacancy are in fact a more moving memorial than any other that I can think of. It goes without saying that place is political as much as it is territorial continually contested, it is a primary source of enmity between family members, neighbors, and nations, destroying the cultural symbols of place, its sacred forms and cherished traditions is a form of aggressive humiliation. Even at the local level, alteration of place can be a source of intense debate and heated dispute contesting zoning change, landmark designation, or new development as common as anyone here who has participated in community planning board meetings, government agency hearings, or protest marches knows. Perhaps the most potent perceptions of place come from recollection, reverie, and dream, the province of poetry. These often take the form of images that appear as messengers from the distant land called childhood. Personal memories, particularly childhood memories, may enshrine a particular room, a house, a neighborhood, a city, a town, a geographical region, a homeland. Place is thus something we carry inside us. In our own consciousness, we imprint ourselves on every place we inhabit, whether on a temporary, long-term, or permanent basis. At the same time, place imprints itself on us. The smallest acts of domesticating space, any kind of space, accomplishes this end. Even transients, prisoners, hotel guests, Migrant workers, campers, and dormitory residents establish temporary forms of place ownership by furnishing a space with various items of personal property. To punitively deny this kind of minimal creation of home is a form of identity theft. Kinesthesia, bodily awareness, along with our five senses, reinforces the notion that we are ourselves, we are place as we register uh, wherever we are with our ability to position and move ourselves in space and receive impressions of place by means of our eyes, our ears, nostrils, palate, skin. Places and people are inseparable. 
We may commune with ourselves when we are alone, but always we perceive ourselves in relationship to places that are populated with faces, voices, and bodies of others. The word, words family and familiar have the same root. The sense of belonging to a particular place is born of lasting ties of blood, friendship, race, and class. Time is another important factor in our understanding of place. We need to recognize that our only, excuse me, we need to recognize that only geographical coordinates persist and that place is eternally mutating. The making and remaking of cities through the addition, subtraction, or renovation of buildings, roads, bridges, parks, and other forms of infrastructure is the defined province of the urban planner, the architect, and the landscape designer. This ordering, shaping, and reshaping of place is the occupation of many who are in this room. You bear an important responsibility because the results of indifference to place are all around us. Everyone is becoming, in, everywhere is becoming increasingly like everywhere else, a situation in which brand and market are commonly used as verbs and corporately run fast food operations, hotels, stores, and service businesses create a ubiquitous sameness in which places become delocalized and is nothing more than what is standard and familiar. I have known the joy of placemaking and placekeeping, had the pleasure of writing about place, and taken satisfaction in running the Foundation for Landscape Studies, whose mission is to promote an active understanding of the meaning of place in human life. To further that mission, I requested that the generous monetary prize attached to the 2012 Henry Hope Reed Award be directed to the Foundation for Landscape Studies and that a portion be given to the Library of American Landscape History. As we have seen, place is variable and ubiquitous and that to lapse into cliche, home is where the heart is. Indeed, the word home is next to the word love, probably the most resonant in the English language. This is not an occasion where there will be um, questions from the audience yet, um, but let me anticipate one. What is the place you love most? Well, that's a hard one. Like all of you, I can think of a number of cherished places, but for me, one certainly does stand out. That, of course, is Central Park. In the deepest sense, it is home to me. Indeed, I never feel that I'm back from any kind of extended stay somewhere else until I've taken a walk in the park. But right now, I'm not in a hurry to go back to New York. Instead, I'm just more than thrilled to be in Chicago in this room, sharing with all of you one of the most memorable moments of my life. That makes this this beautiful space, a very special place indeed, and one that I will carry inside of me for the rest of my days. And thank you, Richard Driehaus, for making this all possible.